bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Oh, come on, you know it. Let's magnify the Lord together. Let's exalt God's name. Listen, get a little blood flowing. If you can, just sort of move your fingers a little and your ankles and do whatever you have to do. And no, you don't necessarily have to sing like the lady does on um, QB. I think that's the thing, you know, where she talks about the heaven open up. But I just want you to let's gather around the word of God today. I know that you saw Tuesday quite a bit of things going on. And for many of you, it triggered a lot of feelings and or emotions concerning what is taking place. Many of us have been taught to be Zionists. And so whoever blesses the seed of Abraham, God blesses them. I do not have on the agenda to go into an in-depth study about that, but I think we need to do that real soon. But I also want to tell you something that has been around as a staple in our understanding of Christian principles for a long time. When they cry, peace and safety, sudden destruction. So do not interpret the events of Tuesday is to indicate it's now time to stop praying, praying for this nation, praying for the leadership, praying for the world, praying for people who are struggling, people trying to find a place. Can you imagine what it must be like to have just moved within the last 21 days or so, trying to escape Laura, and then here you are now, Sally has caused a problem in the place that you went to for refuge. Child of God, you and I may not be experiencing that at this moment. Pray God we never do. In a spiritual sense, however, we do know what it's like to seek refuge in one place only to find out, don't stop here, don't get comfortable. We've got to move again. Now, for those of you who took seriously the assignment of last Noonday Bible study, I applaud you, I commend you. So far, I haven't quite yet figured out how to budget my time well enough to do what I love to do, you know, pass out the sheets, fill in the blank, the homework and all of that. And some of you are probably saying, I sure hope you don't find the time for that. <laughs> Nonetheless, I do want to encourage you, let's try to stay abreast. Let's go back to the book that we introduced. Of course, I went to the 30th chapter of 1 Samuel on last Wednesday, but I did that because that's where the Lord led me and told you that's the way I'm wired. So now let's go back to chapter one. Many of you read that. Let me give you some background. You ready? You have it? All right. What's going on? What's the main point? What shall I get from this? Well, the big picture idea is that Yahweh, God Jehovah, Yahweh, the great king of kings, raises up Samuel to be priest and prophet. In the midst of, write these three words down, please, pain, praise, and prayer. Let me say that again. God raises up Samuel to be priest and prophet. In the midst of, not after, in the middle of the pain, and yet there were those who knew how to praise and prayer. And so this also will introduce us to the prayers of a praying woman. It'll introduce us to Hannah. And as such, 
You and I understand Hannah's hopelessness. We will then go and cover a few other things that takes place and where salvation comes, her salvation. Of course, we'll have an in-depth look at David and Hannah. Hannah first, of course. And we'll see the similar to the foreshadow of Jesus. Yes, even in the Old Testament. Hannah, David, Jesus, and us. Most of our hurt, most of our disappointment comes from seeking after another king besides God. God is better Many sons are a king. Bitterness and barrenness does not mean God forsakenness. God loves people the world rushes aside. Feel like all the hollow black lives matter right there. David, indeed, the man most famous for the killing of the giant Goliath. Yet, he is towering over others in the Bible entirely. Besides the story of his life, he's mentioned, I think, what is it, 182 times in the Old Testament, about 59 times or so in the New Testament. He was a man of many, many talents, a shepherd, a musician, a poet, a warrior, and a king by which all Israelite kings would be judged. He's the measuring rod. Nearly half of the book of Psalms bears David's inscription. The Dead Sea Scrolls attribute, this was an interesting fact for me, another 4,050 psalms to his name. In understanding the Old Testament or the Bible as a whole, it is difficult to overestimate the importance of David. David is important. David is the dominant figure in the entire narrative of Israel. David, of course, came on to the scene at a crucial time in the history of Israel. Israel had settled into the promised land of Canaan. Let me ask you this. If Israel settled in the land of Canaan, and if the land of Canaan has been attributed to the place of the people of the burnt skin, if Canaan was occupied by those dwellers whose rich melanin and those persons whose skin tones had been mellowed, softened, darkened by the kiss of the noonday sun, how did they settle in without standing out? Unless, of course, there was very little difference in distinction of early Israel and what we see today. Read the Bible, understand the history and the progression of things, and we might start to think, wait, what is the word of God up to? If Israel settles into the land, the promised land, wait, the promised land of Canaan, you heard me. And don't you remember how when we start trying to focus afresh on Jesus, especially the birth narratives, and after his birth, the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes that scares a king. <laughs> you see, I told you the Bible is up to date. There are all a lot of people who have a whole lot of power and flex all their muscles. This King Herod scared because he had heard 
of the coming promise. And so I bid you to consider this. What happened? So Joseph takes his young bride and the baby and they flee. Where do they go? Oh, I hear you in the cyber sanctuary. Thank you, students of the word of God. Egypt. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute now. In the Old Testament, Israel has settled into the promised land of Canaan. And in the New Testament, when Jesus shows up to escape, ah, uh, no. Babies, little boys in particular, the creed went out. Every one of them under two years, kill them, destroy them. Trying to stop, but don't you mind what happens from the adversary. It happens and it hurts. But somebody by now ought to have been following the Lord long enough to say, if you can't stop God's truth from marching on. And after many years, Years, years of turmoil because of Israel's disobedience. You know what they did? They did like us. They figured, don't judge us because of what we've done. It's not our fault. It's something else or somebody else. And we want to be like everybody else. So they asked God for a king. And they thought, they felt that if they got the right king, they saw this as the answer to all of their national woes. Oh my God. Please, child of God, please allow God to lead you to exercise your right to vote. I can't tell you how to vote. I would not dare. Just exercise your right to vote because there are a lot of people are trying to tie and connect the wealth and the witness and welfare of our nation to a king-like figure. But God has a way whether we want to own up to our disobedience or not. <laughs> God's got a way. When God gets ready, oh, it's coming. Israel saw that if they got a different king, that would end all of their problems. All of the neighboring nations had king, which seemed to serve them well enough. They wanted to be like everybody else. Kind of reminds me of folk running around now, making and playing fancy closeness to those persons who are, you know, dictators and kings and, but in this country, it's supposed to be a democracy underwritten by theocracy. Oh, well, that's a whole nother lesson for another time. But they wanted a king because they believed that a king guaranteed prosperity. You know, like a lot of people who feel that it doesn't matter to me what a person does as long as my bank account bulges. Lord, have mercy. But perhaps we need to relook at that prosperity that not buy off. COVID-19 pandemic, rich, poor, everyone in between. That's why I sure thank God that I don't wear you all out and you don't get upset because, Pastor, you always asking us to stay safe. You're always saying, let's be patient. You want to get back to church, but you're always saying, let's be patient. And I'm still saying, let us learn how to wait on the Lord. A king, they thought, was their key to success. So in many ways, my beloved sisters and brothers, the book of Samuel 
presents the story of Israel's search for that king. After all, in First and Second Samuel, David would be the ideal king when compared with Saul. And they thought that would be enough. And just what Israel thought they were searching for, <laughs> those of you who read the book, you understand clearly how tragically David disappointed everyone in the end. We saw in the introduction that his story ends with an uncomfortable question mark. So therefore, we are left asking, along with the nation of Israel, we are left asking, is this it? David is the best king we could have hoped for? And look what happened to him. Is there no hope? I want to pause right there. Is there no hope? Fast forward to Jeremiah. Is there bomb in Gilead? My den. For the daughters of my people. This is. <laughs> God understands human hurt. But as I tried my best to preach on last Sunday. In our darkest hour, we can still have hope because God sends a ray of light and a ray of life. And yes, through rays of love. If David's reign, my sisters and my brothers, represents life as life being as good as it gets, then we are left with hopelessness. This should alert us to the fact that the hero of scripture is Israel's and ours, our true king, the king of kings, Yahweh, Jehovah. You call him whatever you want to call him, but fast forward and thou shalt call this is Bible study. When I think about the name of Jesus, you know, something happens to me. Uh, and I'm persuaded that I'm not alone in that. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And what will Jesus do? He shall save his people, all of God's children, from their sin. The Lord is a great God, a great king, above all gods. That's what the Bible says in stanza three, verse three of the 95th Psalm. The Psalm 95 through 100, rightly understood as the theological heart of the entire book. What I love to call the Hebrew hymnal, the book of Psalms, they affirm that Yahweh reigns and that it is truly good news. My brothers and sisters, I'd like to go on. We're just getting started, but we're going to take our time and walk through this. I hope you're not in a hurry. The Lord keep us on this path. It's gonna take a while. So here's what I need you to do. Open up. To 1 Samuel, open up, go back to chapter 1, when we take a look at next week, since I've given prayerfully adequate overview of David, we're going to talk about this young woman who hits the scene. We're going to talk about her problems. We're going to talk about her hurt. We're going to talk about her pain. We're going to talk about in the midst of her pain, her praise and her prayer, I believe it is going to bless 
you're real good. I'm trusting and praying that it is blessing us now. I love you. I appreciate you so much. I want to encourage you again. Let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not or don't faint. God bless you. I've enjoyed this. I'll be listening for your familiar voices in just a few minutes on our prayer line. I'm praying for you, and I believe you're praying for me.